Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Larry Fry, who will discuss the two volumes of his new book project, Communication Activism, Communication for Social Change, and Communication Activism, Media and Performance Activism. Welcome to Rip Rap. Thank you, Jim. I was especially uh, pleased to have the opportunity to talk about your fantastic book project on communication of activism scholarship with you today. I must also say that I heartily agree with Lee Arts <laughs> when he said this two volume set gathers an astounding collection of scholarship on this topic and that the assemblage of a diverse array of activist scholars and scholarly activists is almost too much <laughs> for one review. So after reading these books, I heartily agreed, and as a result, we will set a precedent for Rip Rap, because instead of completing our discussion within one program, we will use two programs to explore these wonderful and instructive books. Because the depth and breadth of your project will take that kind of commitment. I hope that our viewers will make a special effort to watch both programs, because I'm convinced the substance of this experience will be well worth the effort. Oh, thank you, Jim. That's very kind of you. Before we begin our discussion of your book project on that communication activism, I think we're obliged to point out that you've just participated in what was called a circle of dialogue mm -hmm. on engaged scholarship at Wayne State University in Detroit. I believe the focus of that dialogue was taking activism and social justice seriously in our work. Perhaps you'd like to comment on how that experience unfolded. Yeah, it was actually a wonderful three days. It's part of a larger program that Wayne State University is doing on having doctoral honor seminars during the summer. And this is their third one. So they invited me to come in and work with graduate students from all around the country, including one from Finland who came in, about 15 of them. And so for about three days, we really focused on this issue of communication activism. And as part of that, we did this community dialogue program where they asked community members to come in and to comment on what communication activism meant to them. I started off with about a 20 minute talk about that and then we used what was called the Samoan group technique. I know that was so fascinating. <laughs> where people would be able to, there was a core group of us in the middle and then any community member could come up into the circle, there were empty chairs and they could sit down and ask any question they wanted to. And we really went for about, we were supposed to go about an hour, hour and 15, we went about two hours and a half. Wow. So they just, and, and it really was a wonderful technique for getting lots of ideas onto the table. And so we had people who represented the administration, people who represented nonprofit organizations, people who represented other community um, members out there. And um, it was a wonderful experience in terms of talking about, particularly what could Wayne State do, since it's right down there in the city and as you know there's a lot of needs in Detroit for community action and so we started to get into the actual sort of policies of what could students do what groups could they work with so it wasn't just all sort of talk there was some action items that came out of it too. Well and you had mentioned earlier to me that you met people like Grace Boggs and, and got the tour. And I did that was a wonderful experience I just read Grace Boggs's um, autobiography this past week and a woman named Shay Howell who's a communication scholar she's chair of the communication department at Oakland University she's been a community organizer in Detroit for many many years and she arranged for Grace Boggs to come in and talk with our students and to give us a tour of Detroit and the students were just thrilled with this I mean you know we've been sitting there for a day already talking at a kind of conceptual level about what would it mean to get out and do these kind of community projects and then we get about a two and a half hour tour where we go and we look at the community gardens that are being done some of the kinds of facilities where they're doing job training and along the way we get talks by each of the people who are organizing these things and these are folks who you know know a lot about activism both at the pragmatic level and at the conceptual level so the students were ready to get out there right after that and, and Grace, at, I think she's 92 years old right now, she is just so alive and so full of energy and so committed to what she's doing in Detroit. It's just, um, she really serves as a role model for so many individuals. Well, and that's what I found fascinating with the book also is that you have this dialogue 
uh, that it's important for people to be talking and talking seriously about the issues in front of them as well as this commitment to the doing part of it. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the difficulties with any kind of community-based work is that, especially this kind of activism that we're talking about, is that people are relatively isolated who are doing it. I mean, sometimes, and as you well know, academia can be a pretty lonely place. You know, you sort of go and do your work by yourself, then you're in the office by yourself, and you're spending a lot of time. And, and because of that, you don't always network with people. And so one of the things we're trying to do is to actually get a network. A number of us have just started a social justice support group for those who are doing this kind of work. And they'll send us manuscripts and we'll respond to it. We'll try to get them in touch with whoever can help them. And so a lot of what came out of the sessions this week were networking with individuals and providing resources to folks to do this work. But I thought what was also fascinating to me is this careful attention to not only an awareness of, but a study of the dynamics of substantive social change. Yeah, I'm, I'm a scholar. I mean, it, I bill myself as a scholar, first and foremost. Um, if I'm an activist, it's a scholar activist. If I wanted to be an activist in the sense of a full-time situation, then I would go and do that. And I would join community groups and I would um, run not-for-profit organizations, but I'm somebody who loves to study the process. The beauty of this, of course, is that the study is also action. That is, we're all participating from an activist perspective. So it's not like we're studying it from a hands-off position where we observe the other, but we try to immerse ourselves in the community work, try to engage it, do engage scholarship, and then try to reflect on that and try to talk about it and try to feature it in these kinds of venues, these kind of book projects. So how did you evolve to this particular position? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I would say that a lot of things have influenced me. I, I moved around uh, when I was young uh, quite a bit. My family's moved around 20 times. Um, we've lived overseas, and I've lived in London and Geneva and Rome and a number of other cities. And I think I saw a lot of different ways to live a life. And then when I came back to the States, I was very politically um, aware. Um, so that was during the Vietnam War. And so I, I think that the, the whole notion of political scholarship was built into me early on, especially in terms of seeing the United States from afar and then coming back to it and trying to change things like the war at that particular time. After that, when I went to school, of course, that's kind of beaten out of you a little bit. Um, they don't give you a lot of training in that at the time that I went to graduate school. And I think um, I fell into a, a sort of a study I approached it at that time of a residential facility for people with AIDS in Chicago that's called Bonaventure House. And I did a book called The Fragile Community, Living Together with AIDS, and a whole bunch of other projects. And what that project really did for me was to sort of get me back into the political awareness and to say that, look, research can be meaningful, both for the individuals that you're privileged to work with, and also in terms of perhaps doing so, some systemic change. In that particular case, those individuals were very marginalized because of the stigma of AIDS. And so I tried to bring some resources to bear to examine that situation, try to confront it, try to do things. I was a volunteer there for about seven years. And so, I, and then I, as I was doing that, I started to articulate a social justice perspective that talked about how could, in, in my case, communication researchers bring their resources to bear to make a difference with those who are most marginalized, those who are most shut out of the American dream. And the result of that now is the communication activism work. Well, it's clear that you're talking about an activism that just isn't a matter of awareness, like you're saying, but it's something where you really do get into the specific issues and try to work for change. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think, you know, lots of people divide the, the pie, in a sense, in, in scholarship. You know, so folks will talk about quantitative versus qualitative. They'll talk about theoretical versus applied. You know, I'm not a big divider in that way, but if, you, if I had to divide the pie, I would divide it in a way of talking about there are some people who, um, and they do a very good job, they describe, they interpret, they critique, you know, they might even make some recommendations for suggestions. And I would say that they take a relatively observer role, and that's a pretty traditional academic approach, as you well know. And then on the other side of that divide are those who want to intervene, those who want to get into the river, in a sense, 
maybe build a dam, maybe change the flow of the river. Of course, working collaboratively with the people and animals that live in the ri river to keep the metaphor going there. And I fall on that side. Of course, there are different ways to intervene. And so the divide becomes, sure, you could intervene on behalf of IBM and help the managers make more money. That would be one type of intervention work and action-oriented. Or you could bring your resources to bear. And by resources, I'm saying, look, I'm grounded in theories and methods and pedagogies, other practices. And you can bring all of those to bear to maybe do something with those who are most marginalized, those who are most shut out again. And so that's the kind of divide that I would set up. And you're right, it is action-based, but it's action-based for social justice. And that's a really important part of it. Well, and there was another thing I noticed that you have quite a bit to say about the origins of communication scholarship as being sort of the appendium of the corporate world and, you know, justifying mm -hmm. things and saying, well, this is how we ought to do it. And, you know, and that's not exactly what you're interested in. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm a Big Ten person, and, um, you know, growing up in the academy, I guess there was a time when I didn't really understand and challenge the sort of structures that were there. But in my own discipline, for example, there is a very healthy study of organizational communication. And there's one journal in that side of the coin in my discipline, and it's called Management Communication Quarterly. It's not called Worker Communication <laughs> Quarterly. Uh, could be called that. And so, you know, there has been a sort of managerial bias, a kind of, and lots of communication scholars have tried to help those kinds of organizations to increase their bottom line. And, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that they ought not to do that. We ought, we ought to choose what we're going to do. On, on the other hand, you ought to be able to own your choices. You ought to be able to say, look, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. This is what I believe in. And I happen to work only for not-for-profit organizations. I've, I do a lot of consulting, but I've never made a dime <laughs> off of it. It's cost me a lot of money to do consulting. So you're right, That's those kinds of values of the corporate side are not what I share. And so I've, I've taken a very different route in academia. I find that fascinating, actually. Um, and I found interesting in your book project that it doesn't also doesn't privilege theory over application, that it it, you criticize, like you were saying, communication scholars and their counterparts in social sciences and humanities when they all too frequently shy away from addressing important social issues. So it's not only they're staying kind of conveniently within this very carefully uh, uh -huh. prescribed mandate, but they're, they just don't address the issues. No, you're right. I mean, there are, again, lots of different ways to divide the pie. And one of the ways that people have often divided it is sort of theory and application, theory and applied. Um, you know, if you take the root of the word theory, it comes from the Greek theoria, and what that means is to be a spectator, to look at things. So from that kind of perspective, a kind of theoretical perspective, you're supposed to be sort of standoffish, not influence the things that happen. And then you come from the sort of applied practical, of course, that's grounded in solving real world problems. And again, those problems might be for the corporate sector, they might be for the nonprofit sector, they might be for social justice, so there are a lot of different types of problems. What I've tried to do a little bit is to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, <laughs> you know, and to say that, look, you can combine theory with application, and what you get then is praxis. That's our typical understanding of that, the theory, method, practice, they all go together. And it's, it's not a matter of them being three separate things, they're intimately woven. And one of the things I'm, I'm proud of, of in my work and the books that I do, especially these kinds of books, is that we do privilege theory. But that's what scholars do. They provide explanations about the world. And so one of the things we asked all of the scholars to do in these books was to not just tell us, like, what are the practical things you did, the steps one, two, three, four. That can be done in any kind of manual or handbook. But to really tell us, well, how did this emerge from your theories that you run around in? that you've been exploring for a good part of your life. And so we do merge them together, I hope, in a kind of seamless way. Um, whether we do or not, we'll let the readers decide. Oh, I that. thought you did an excellent job oh, with thank that. You. And, but that brought up the thing, too, of how it's situated historically and how you know the scholarship has grown, uh, both as 
a study of, of rhetoric and communication and the process of uh, communication, but also uh, you, you noted in the book about how act, this activist version grew out of the 1968 New Orleans uh -huh. Conference on Research and Instructional Development. So there's both the long-term development and then there's been this different edge that's come up. Yeah, my discipline is an odd <coughs> discipline of communication. It, it, you know, traces its roots back to Aristotle and all sorts of other folks. But the formal discipline comes about around 1916, 1918, comes out of English, breaks off. But it was always a practical discipline. And that's what we call it in the sense that it was concerned with helping people to solve problems. In those days, they were the problems that John Dewey was talking about of doing better decision making, group decision making to promote democratic discourse. We're helping people to be better speakers. And what happened was that for, for a while, that went on quite a while, and then for whatever reasons, um, we started to try to emulate all of those other social sciences that had emulated physics and chemistry. And the US government, of course, was not funding applied research. They shifted in ter terms of doing this sort of basic laboratory experiments. And my discipline did that too. And so in 1968, the conference you mentioned brought together a number of scholars who sort of said, wait a minute, what happened to our practical roots? What happened to all of the things that we have to contribute? We've gotten away from that. And they said, let's start doing that. Now, the one thing I will say is that it took quite a while to move from a sort of position of let's do something to let's do something for for-profit organizations to let's do something for those who are most marginalized. In fact, in the early days of Applied, I just wrote a chapter on this um, in the handbook of Applied Communication Research that I'm editing right now, and pointed out that in the beginning, um, consulting for for-profit organizations was very much conflated with Applied. And it was sort of assumed that, of course, you have a client and they're paying you, and that's the way we do that kind of work. So it took another mm, 20, 30 years after that 68 conference to articulate a kind of social justice perspective. And that's a very difficult position to pursue because there isn't the support, I mean, you know, in terms of corporate. Absolutely. I mean, I, th I think there are those in the academy, for example, who would say, you know, look, you're Stanley Fish makes this argument in an op-ed piece that he wrote in the New York Times. He said, look, your job is not to save the world. You're an academic. Your Great. job is to interpret the world, <laughs> not to change the world. Um, a friend of mine said that um, he responded humorously to Stanley Fish by saying that um, if he were to draw a cartoon of Rome burning, he would have Stanley Fish saying to Seneca, your job is to interpret the flames, <laughs> not to put them put out. Them out. You know? <laughs> so but there are, it has taken a while, and there are still people who are very um, upset with this kind of work, uh, both because they don't want to see it done, they think it's too political, it's taking positions, and two, they don't maybe want to be called out on the kind of work that they're doing. That, you know, it's always been assumed, well, of course the corporate world is fine. You know, nobody gets upset when we teach public relations. Okay, when we teach corporate communication, everybody goes, but of course we're teaching their business communication. And then you start to say, well, social justice in communication. And people go, oh, you're being ideological. You're being political. Really? You're not being political and ideological when you support businesses? Again, I, I want to be a big tent person, but you're right in the sense that there hasn't been the kind of cohort, the kind of support for doing the social justice work. Well, I think it's easy for the discourse to become really deficient if not all the voices are heard. You know that absolutely. If, if we start skewing over to what's just the vested interest for the big corporations and government, and leave out the rest, then it's an unbalanced situation. You're right. I mean, there are, there are so many voices in the mix that need to be heard, and um, you know, fortunately, I think that this is all. There are a lot of confluences that have led to sort of an activist approach. And certainly those who have been critical theorists have contributed, and you've had many on your show that, you know, critique the world, that do a great job of pointing out where power lies, what are some of the values that we privilege. And so the next step is that sort of intervention step. It's one thing to critique. It's another to get involved and do something about it. Grace Boggs said this uh, week. There's a difference between rebellion and revolution. Um, and I think that's <laughs> I a good that. way to put that. You know, right. It's easy to rebel and say, I don't like this, I don't like that. 
you know, somebody should do this, somebody should do that, and then really a kind of revolution in the sense of, of getting your hands dirty, should we say. That's the metaphor, of course. It might be getting your hands clean, in a way. Right. But one of the things that's always fascinating with projects of this type is how you gather your authors together, the participants. And I also was fascinated how you did it, because uh, there's quite a diverse group, as you said earlier. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've, I've done a number of edited books. Um, I think I've done about 10 of them. And uh, one of the ways I approach that is through open calls. And I put that out over lists, various listservs, certainly in my discipline, but in other disciplines. And what I found in this particular project, normally I know the people who are doing work. So in the Handbook of Applied, I know who's doing the Applied. This time I got so many different proposals from folks, and I didn't know a lot of them. And um, they did come from all sorts of different places, from teaching institutions, from Research One institutions, graduate students. And it was an eclectic mix. I, the publisher is so happy we're now doing a, a third volume. And I just put out the call. And we got 85 proposals where we could only use nine. When I edited a special issue of Journal of Applied Communication Research on social justice, we got about 15. That was about 10 years ago. So there, I think there are a lot of people doing this work. Um, a lot of them don't necessarily write it up. And they didn't have opportunities. The journals had shut them out. Um, they weren't really receptive to that kind of work. And so I think there were a lot of people who said, wow, I, I'll take this opportunity to do something and, and to write a proposal, write a chapter. And it, originally, it was just to be a one volume book. Right. And we got so many So much proposals. for that. Right, so much for that. Right, I could probably, and in fact, the, the publisher said, could we do a journal? And we're, we're talking about that potentially. In other words, there's so many people out there who are doing it and who resonated and who wanted to write their story that um, we got a lot of great proposals. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons we did two volumes. That's one of the reasons we focus on different categories, different types of interests. But I, I was also fascinated with instructions you gave to those mm -hmm. who joined this project. Um, not only were you asking for a thorough explanation of the specific situation, problem, issue, and activities, but then you wanted to take further. You wanted to have them situate that analysis within relevant theory, research, and practice, and, um, and even go beyond that. And this is what I thought was fascinating. Reflect on the dialectical tensions and paradoxes. You really are, you know, laying this out in a very interesting way. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, one of, you know, what we didn't want was these just to be stories of, oh, on Tuesday I did this and on Wednesday and, and to sort of say, look at the great work we did and look at the changes we made and, you know, and, and there are plenty of sort of stories that are written like that and some of them are really inspiring, of course. And so what I was asking people to do is, look, you know, this is a scholarly book. This is who's going to be reading it primarily. You know, hopefully some activists will read it. Hopefully the general public will take a look at it. But you're really talking to other scholars. So one, give me the theories that either were grounded into this project from the beginning or that make sense after you've done it. Tell me in detail the kinds of methods used. Let me hear, what did you do? How did you collect the text? How, did, how many people did you interview? How many hours did you spend in the field? But then as you say, you know, what are the kinds of tensions that you experienced? I mean, so often these kinds of um, stories, like, like I just said, are written from the perspective of, oh, and then we triumph and, you know, we all hold hands and it was great. And I said, no, uh, I come from a dialectical perspective, which says essentially that rather than thinking of life as a feather bed where we all lie down, it's a lot more like a tightrope. And you're navigating all of these things. And just as one thing you're navigating, is the scholar and the activist. You know, these don't always go together. Scholars write at a pretty slow right. pace. Activists need it yesterday. And so we ask people to examine what are those tensions? You know, or what's the tension between being a consultant and being an activist? And to not say you have to choose one or the other, but tell us, give us a complex read on that. And that really came out of the work I did at the residential facility with people with AIDS, where I saw people struggling every day with life and death and sort of negotiating those tensions. And so we asked them to deal with that, to give us the lessons learned. We tried to make them very rich in that regard. Well, and that made the depth, you know, that I was saying earlier, where this was had to be a two-program uh, 
you know, a huh. session for us because there's this extraordinary depth that, that came out. And, and coming off of that, what are some of the theorists that, uh, that you base your work on? Um, I do primarily come out of a dialectical perspective. Bakhtin is certainly somebody who's influenced my work a lot. Um, Barbara Montgomery and uh, communication. And they do talk about this kind of tension model that um, people draw on and try to try to navigate as they move through. So I would say that the dialectical perspective in particular, but the types of theories in the book, um, because it is an edited book, and I forget how many chapters we have, but 22 or 23, range everywhere from social scientific theories of persuasion, sort of the typical quantitative approaches of fear appeals, to much more interpretive kinds of theories, to very critical Marxist types of theories. So they span the gamut in terms of what people are relying on. And one of the things I think that shows um, is that you can approach this work from virtually any theoretical perspective. I mean, some of these folks are from rhetoric, and so they rely on rhetorical theories. They might rely on Aristotle, Plato, you know, Quintilian, you know, contemporary Burke, Kenneth Burke, for example. So, and, and they talk about those. Other people are going to be coming from a very different type of perspective, a much more quantitative um, perspective, and they're going to rely on health campaign literatures, on effects theory, media effects theory. And so it, there's a big tent there in terms of what people could draw on. Same is true on the methods, by the way. Again, we often sort of, there's big debates in academia, as you know, between the quantitative <laughs> and the qualitative <laughs> folks. And, and, you know, that doesn't resonate here. We have both, we have all of them represented, or a lot, in terms of rhetorical methods, qualitative methods, quantitative methods. And what we find is, you know, whatever works is really the answer there. One of the questions I had as I reflected on this is, how was it as you worked with them through the book process? Because uh, you had this very stringent requirements. Yeah. I don't mean restrictive, but just thorough preparation. So it seemed to me that maybe the activists need a little pumping up on the theory and maybe the theorists need, or what? You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, <laughs> one of the difficulties in these kinds of chapters is, is A, each of them could almost be a book. So, I mean, these are, a lot of these are long-term projects. I mean, right. six, seven year types of projects with many different angles on it. And so we said, hey, we don't, we can't give you a book, but we can give you 25, 30 pages. So let's hone it down. And some of these did come in at 60, 70 pages. In, a, in some cases, the theoreticians gave us a lot of that kind of background and not enough of the pragmatics. And we would say, look, we need to hear a lot more about this. And then the reverse is that there are a lot of folks who are, who are activists, and that's what they're used to doing. And now, they're all scholars, don't get me wrong. They've, they've done research before. But they're not used to writing about this. Their scholarship often is pretty traditional. And so we said to them, you've got to ground it in the theory. And, and what I will say to you is that I am a heavy-handed editor. Well, I think that will, will end this part of the program sure. as far as the foundational uh, framework for your two-volume work, and then the next program will be on the specific volumes. Great. So thank you for being on Rip Red. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm.